month on book break we are talking about top summer must reads and I'm joined in the studio by Jonathan Harvey and Jessie Burton. I'm Alex Hemmingsley and this is Book Break. This month I'm joined by two wonderful authors. Jonathan Harvey is a writer whose work includes award-winning theatre productions as well as TV credits such as Coronation Street, Gimme 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 and Shameless. His new novel, The Girl Who Just Appeared, is out this month, but more importantly he also won the Space Hopper Championship at Butlin's Pwelli? Patheli. Patheli! <laughs> in 1976. Welcome Jonathan. <laughs> and Jessie Burton juggled her burgeoning writing career amidst careers in the city and as an actress. Her debut novel The Miniaturist, which is causing quite the sensation, is out now. And welcome Jessie. Thank you, hello. <laughs> also on this month's show, we join the author of The Unwitting, Ellen Feldman, to share with us all the secrets of her writer's room. And we'll update you on all the latest books that should be on all of your holiday reading lists this summer. So guys, hi, hi. Hi, hi. Okay. Hello. Now then, Jonathan, you've done all sorts. Your your kind of writing career has been so varied, but where did it begin? Which discipline for you? I started off in theatre. Um, right. I, I, used, I was really lucky. I grew up in Liverpool, and the local theatre uh, had a whole season of plays by local writers and young oh, people. Yeah. And uh, at the end of that, they had a... And it was a pound to get in if you were under 18. So I used to go. And at the end of that... And it was really good stuff. There was a play called Watching by um, mm -hmm. Jim Hitchmer that became a sitcom. Yeah. Heidi Thomas wrote a play called Sham Shamrocks and Crocodiles and she now she yeah. created Cranford and um, well, she, she wrote Cranford and created Call the Midwife mm -hmm. and so it was, a really, it, was a really, it was good quality stuff and at the end they ran a Young Writers Festival and I entered and I won the, the top prize and so I got yeah. a production on when I was 17 so <laughs> it started like that way. And you still juggle different writing disciplines I do, So yeah. how do you how does that work? Are you Do you sort of find you need to do one in order to do the other I just, rests from each other? I just sort of have to plan really and I think like, I, d I love writing for Coronation Street because mm -hmm. writing is such a lonely business, really, but there's mm. 18 writers on that show, mm -hmm. so there's a real support network. It's yeah. like going to AA or something. You're in a room yeah. with people who understand <laughs> what you're talking about and have the same <laughs> mad thoughts as you. Um, uh, and, and, and so I'd hate to leave that because it gives me, yeah. it gives me a, a, a common ground with people, I suppose. Um, but I think doing other work informs that, and that informs my other work mm -hmm. as well. So as, as much as I can, I like to do lots of different things. Yeah, and now, Jesse, you're at the other end of the spectrum. It's debut time for you. Yeah. And how has that journey been? Do you have, like, hundreds of old manuscripts <laughs> under your bed, or was there this just, like, emerge perfectly formed in your mind? Oh, it definitely did not emerge perfectly formed. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be lovely if it did. Yeah, no, it just, it just happened. It was there. Oh, I've um, got a book. Yeah, First draft. Yeah, no, it's just how it looked when I wrote it. Um, no, definitely not. I have actually I just moved flat and I found mm -hmm. all my old attempts <gasps> and, and I piled them up and it came to seventeen <gasps> manuscripts and some are, you know, super raw and there's just yeah. ideas and there's notebooks everywhere and yeah, it's a very for me it was a very sprawling, mm -hmm. sporadic, scrappy. And process. is it miniaturists in all of them or were you starting off with, you know, international space stations or yeah. working? No, it used to be set on Mars and then yeah. <laughs> no, it definitely had a miniaturist always right. um, but the identity of the miniaturist even the gender actually changed yeah. Ooh. yeah and what surprised you about the process is you know has there been an editorial bit that went on for much longer than you thought or mm -hmm. something that was unexpectedly joyful or <laughs> there's been lots of moments of joyfulness definitely <laughs> and more recently like seeing the cover for the first yeah. time and also knowing just how hard everyone's worked on it like at the publisher at Picador mm. it's just it's very touching as much yeah. as anything um, you realise how much of a gap Oh, makes totally. it yeah, it's a whole industry, obviously, and and well, I I didn't really have that many expectations, so I mm -hmm. wasn't actually going to be surprised by anything because yeah. nothing really. I didn't know what to expect. Yeah, but um, yeah. yeah, I mean, the editorial process is always interesting. Like having mm. people kind of own your manuscript mm. is mm. interesting. 
Amazing. Now, Jonathan, tell us a little bit about the book you're here to talk to us about today, which is The Girl Who Just Appeared. The Girl Who Just Appeared. It's about uh, a woman called Holly who mm -hmm. was adopted. And uh, the, as the book opens, her, her adop both her adoptive parents have just died and she feels now is the right time to trace her birth family. Mm -hmm. uh, and she's from Tring, lives in London. Uh, but all she has to go on is, uh, is a bit of a birth certificate with her mother's yeah. name and an address in Liverpool. And on the very same day as, as her um, adoptive mother mother's funeral she gets a google alert on her phone and it says that the flat that she was born in is up for rent so she sells her mum's house and she rents this property mm -hmm. in Liverpool and she goes there on the quest to mm -hmm. find her birth mother on the second day that she's there uh, she finds under the floorboards a biscuit tin and in the biscuit tin is all these papers and it's mm -hmm. the diary of a 15 year old boy he's quite illiterate <gasps> uh, from about 1981 going mm -hmm. through living in, the, in that area in the Toxteth riots and um, slow and it's, so it's a sort of dual time film mm. novel. You, you're with Darren in 1981 and Holly mm -hmm. in the present day as she tries to work out who is this boy is he related to me mm -hmm. you know uh, is he my brother? Well, and, yeah. and sort of try and and find him and find her mother. And what were the inspirations behind those characters? Was it sort of just did did you, was it the idea of finding the box with the letters, or was it a specific voice? Because Holly has such yeah. a kind of clear voice in yeah. it. I think. Well, to be honest with you, the Darren thing I did write years and years and years ago. Ah. It was probably the first thing I ever wrote. I just read um, the Colour Purple, and I oh. loved the fact there was loads of spelling mistakes. In yeah, it. yeah. <laughs> So I thought, well, I'll have a go at that. And I just put it away, and it, was only, it wasn't very long. Um, and I always knew I wanted to do something with it, but I wasn't sure what. Mm -hmm. And then I'd read quite a bit of Jojo Moyes recently, and, mm. and she does I dual time for us yeah. so well. Uh, so I picked her brains a little bit, and I thought, mm. sort of, I'm just going to go for it. Yeah. So um, I stole, so I, And I didn't know what the relationship was between them when I started out, and then and it, I sort of dawned mm -hmm. them as I went along, and I sort of yeah. burrowed a bit further. So um, the two time zones, mm. we've got Holly. It, it opens yeah. with a little bit of Holly in yes. 1981, which Just really like kind of parachutes you into yeah. the the sort of whole concept. Um, and then you've got, and then it's present day Holly yeah. and Darren in 1981. Yeah. And how did that work? Did you have to kind of do your Holly narrative and then weave Darren in later, or did no, you, with, just... you like kind of John Michelle Jar style with all the laptops <laughs> open, doing all these different things? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I just wrote it like it's written, really. So I just so you, I thought, oh, yeah. it'd be, I, I mean, I think my soap background as well means, oh, let's get to a climax can, yeah. just before you go to to the past, and then let's leave the past at a climax. Yeah. And it, it just, I just wrote it that way. I didn't do too much planning. So yeah, it's, it was a better developed muscle from the idea, like soaps yeah. have got their d different narratives of different clar yeah. characters going on. So yeah. you kind of, yeah, because the different yes. novelist I mean, who just done one narrative. I mean, I did go back at the end, obviously, and rewrite totally the whole exactly. thing. When I, re when I realised what my what my twist was yeah, to sort of yeah. incorporate that, but yeah, no, it, I didn't. And did do you prefer writing one or the other? Did you kind of wake up thinking, oh god, another holiday? I I suppose I really enjoyed doing the Darren stuff yeah. because I, all my novels have been first person female, mm -hmm. and this was my oh, first yeah. male character, yeah. so um, that was quite good fun. And also, someone. I just lost myself in that world, and I'm mm. from Liverpool, and, and just yeah. and I did lots of reading about the, the the riots and and Britain at the time. So I really enjoyed that sort of forensic stuff. Yeah, and there's this is a publishing question alert now. Yeah. <laughs> all your books, because you have this is the third one you published, yeah. and they've all got quite a distinctive jacket. They look Ooh. like they they kind of go together. And is yeah. that something you had input in, no. or it's just a sort of happy coincidence? It's 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 the publishers choose that really. I was very happy with it. Um, it was, I think it was the first one was about a, a soap actress and they mm -hmm. wanted it to look a bit like a theatrical poster. Right, okay. And, and it's obviously become a bit different now, but yeah, yeah that was yeah. the idea behind oh, it. That's great, because I always, yeah, the, the idea of being presented with the jacket and doing that sort of rictus grin. <laughs> oh, thanks very much, guys. <laughs> I really yeah. like that cover. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah it's cool. Very chic. Hello and welcome. This month on Book Break, we are being drawn to dark subjects and dark settings. I'm Alex Hemmingsley, and I'll be talking to MJ McGrath and Emily Sinjun Mandel. Hello, 
I'm Alex Hemmingsley and welcome to this new episode of Book Break. This month we're off to North America for our interviews as I'm joined here in the studio by MJ McGrath, an English writer who sets her current novel series in Northern Canada, and Emily St. John Mandel, now I hope I get this right, who is a Canadian writer living in New York who's fit us into her UK book tour. And MJ McGrath's new book, The Bone Seeker, is the latest in the beautiful, eerie and award-nominated E.D. Kiklutuk, yes, <laughs> series, following on from White Heat and The Boy in the Snow. She's also known as Melanie McGrath. Under this name, she's produced some critically acclaimed works of non-fiction. We'll go there. <laughs> and Emily St. John Mandel's new novel, Station Eleven, is causing quite a stir, having been named as an Observer Thriller of the Month and been longlisted for the 2014 National Book Awards already. We're thrilled she's found a bit of spare time for us on her tour. Hi and welcome, ladies. Hi, <laughs> now then, also on this month's show, we welcome first-time American novelist Nicholas Butler to talk all sorts, including writing, Wisconsin and buffaloes. His debut novel, Shotgun Love Songs, one of my favourites of the year has had everyone singing his praises and we are quite sure he has a bright future ahead. We'll also be hearing about the new collaborative novel, Taking Hollywood, that sees novelist Shari Lowe and showbiz expert Ross King combining their talents to produce a gritty, sexy Tinseltown thriller. Now then, ladies, let's get to the chat. Now, first of all, Melanie, explain this to me. How does an English writer writing in England end up writing not just one, but a series of books, fiction and non-fiction, about the Canadian she, Arctic. She, she, right. the, the, the quick answer is she gets very, very lucky. Ah. <laughs> uh, I got sent up to Ellesmere Island, which is basically as far north as you can go without falling off the edge of the mm -hmm. earth, um, to do a series of journalistic assignments, um, among which was investigating polar bear hunting. Oh, wow. And when I was up there, I just, I fell in love with the place, uh, I saw it had loads and loads of stories, and I met uh, an ex-polar bear hunter um, who had become a guide, who was the inspiration a woman, tiny mm -hmm. little Inuit woman, mm. who, but fierce, mm. who became the inspiration for, for Edie. I see. And because you've also, you, you've, you've, this is a series of novels, the Edie ones, and then, but you've also written a factual account. It was the, the Canadian Inuit people, the long, the long exile is the title of the non-fiction book, but yeah. it's about the relocation of the Ungava. That's Inuit. It. I have so many new <laughs> words. <laughs> I could do walrus and I could do nanook and then all the other words. That'll do. That's, that's, that covers most ground. Yeah. So what's that? That's that's a sort of his, it's factual. Is it recent history? I don't know anything about this. Uh, it was quite. It was quite recent. It was an episode where uh, the the Inuit, for, for all kinds of geopolitical reasons, Canada was very keen to establish the high Arctic as its own after the Second World War. Oh, I see. Um, so so and uh, so it needed Canadian. And it thought um, there's only one bunch of Canadians who are going to survive up there, so we'll just dump these people Shove on the beach there. somewhere. And uh, it was a very tough process of survival, and many of them didn't survive, yeah. um, but they are still up there mm -hmm. now. Um, because it feels like a really kind of untapped world for fiction. There's sort of, I don't feel like there's anyone else doing stories there. No, well, that was one of the things that really attracted me. It was a really kind of mythic epic place mm. um, that was full of, of stories and full of spirits and traditional stories as well as being um, these tiny little communities which are like goldfish bowls mm -hmm. where um, you know, I, I write crime and where if a crime happens everyone knows about it mm. you probably know the, the perpetrator you certainly know the victim uh, and there's nowhere to go. There's nowhere to yeah, run. Yeah. Uh, there's the huge, op wide open tundra. Yeah. There's kind of yeah, nowhere and everywhere that, to yeah. hide. <laughs> so, and, um, uh, you know, crime really impacts on those little communities. So it mm. was a kind of epic scale and the tiny little fishbowl mm. world, the contrast yeah. between the two that really fascinated me. And Emily, your, your novel sort of certainly is this sort of world that's sort of been devastated by disease right, yes. but it's not just about the survival of human beings it's about kind of survival of humanity and culture and it's it's about more than just finding food it's kind of emotional and intellectual cultural nourishment that sort of hasn't I mean, those sort of dystopian novels hasn't really been done before why what was the seed for that <laughs> uh, the seed was partly that I thought it would be interesting to write about the life of an actor mm -hmm. now, my previous three novels were generally categorized as literary noir and I was very happy with the way they turned out. 
but it seemed like a nice moment to branch out and do something completely different. Yes. And at the same time, I wanted to write a kind of love letter to the modern world. Yeah. And of course, one way to consider the modern world is to write about its absence. So it mm -hmm. seemed to me it would be quite interesting to write a post-apocalyptic novel for mm -hmm. that reason. And, and as for the role of art, I have read a few post-apocalyptic novels, and mm. as you alluded to, the ground that they cover does tend to involve the struggle for survival. It's like, oh, the no, horror I've got and no mayhem. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, you know, Cormac McCarthy's *The Road* is a fantastic mm. example of that. And I thought it might be interesting to write about what comes next after mm -hmm. that, when we've perhaps solved the basic problems. Yes, they kind of—it's it's 20 years ago exactly, that, that disasters exactly. happened. Yeah. And so they kind of they got the basics sorted by now. It's they not do, an immediate right. kind of ah. That, that there's there's it's more of the emotional crisis that they're exactly, kind of coming. Exactly right. To the burden of memory, trying to find a way yeah. to reconcile themselves with a strange new world. Yeah. yeah. So I'm interested in kind of question of how you two perceive yourselves because you mentioned about dystopian novels just then, and there is a kind of quite a trend for them at the moment. Do you see yourself as one, or do you kind of rail against categorization a bit, or do you, uh, you do not care? It's like right, it's my book right. Over you know, I keep on falling into categories in my career. Mm. <laughs> um, I always just set out to write literary fiction with the strongest possible narrative drive. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that when you write literary fiction with an emphasis on plot, that can push you very rapidly into crime in the case of my yeah. first three books, yeah. a phenomenon where you write a literary fiction, a piece of literary fiction with a crime in it. You've written crime yes. fiction. Uh, yes. yeah. And then with this book, um, same thing. I just wanted to write something with a strong plot, and it happened to be dystopian. Yeah. And now I'm a sci-fi writer, apparently. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah these, you know, uh, people asking you all kinds of questions right. about the whole genre, and you're like, oh, exactly, what have you made exactly. about four? Yeah. <laughs> Terrifying. Yeah. And Melanie, you write fiction, obviously, non-fiction, mm. and journalism. Mm. And so do you just kind of, you know, if you're, I mean, they don't say it at the passport queue anymore, but do you just say, I'm a writer? Or do you kind of secretly think, well, I'm a novelist now, but I still do some non-fiction? Or do you absolutely not care? If you can earn your living at your laptop, that's fine by you. Uh, do you know, I don't really see the distinction, because for me, it's all about telling a great story. Mm -hmm. And whether the story's fact-based or imaginative-based doesn't really matter to me. What it's about, for me, is taking some characters, some protagonists that people can identify with, and that say something interesting about the world, and putting them, uh, usually putting them through some quite tough times. Mm. Um, and yeah, the narrative drive, I think, is very, very important. I don't yeah. read books where nothing happens. Uh, I like books where things happen and you want to turn the page. And so you, you tend to write into what you read. And I read very widely, fiction and non-fiction, but always with a, a story focus, I think. Yes. So for, for readers who, haven't, who are coming this time to the series, could you kind of let us know enough, you know, if you want to just sort of queue jump and get in on the third novel, what would we need to know about ED? Well, each novel stands on it by itself, yeah. so you don't really have to have read the first one to enjoy the third one, okay. and so on. But and she's um, the thread. She's the yeah. she's the thread, and her her sidekick Derek, who is the policeman. Uh, Edie is a um, an ex polar bear hunter turned guide. She's also a teacher, mm -hmm. um, and she's she's a she's tough. She's tiny but tough, um, and uh, she is an outsider. Um, because I'm interested in outsiders mm. in outsiders worlds yes. and that particularly interests me there's no uh, it, the culture is an outsider culture that's being very rapidly invaded if you like by the kind of forces of uh, uh, economic change up there mm -hmm. in, in the Arctic global warming and so on so there's an awful lot to deal with as well as just being in these tiny little yeah. communities uh, where crimes happen and you can't get away. Yeah. <laughs> and where do, where are we going with her, with the series? Is that is is it kind of infinite, or do you have a perfectly formed arc of five novels in your head, or are you kind of uh, carrying I'm gonna, on? I'm going to suck it and see. She's she's very good at getting herself into trouble. So as oh, long as she gets is, herself into trouble, I have, to get herself, <laughs> I, I have to get her out of trouble. Um, we'll we'll keep on. I think. It's, okay. uh, I, I'm fond of her. I'd I'd be sad to see her 
yeah, I, I want to see how she develops and yeah. what she does with her life. And, and Emily, the, the nature of Station Eleven is that it's a, it's kind of an ensemble piece, isn't it? it is, you've got, absolutely. You've got this group of people right. who are sort of, sort of sort of forced together, but also chosen to be together on mm -hmm. this kind of cultural mission of keeping storytelling alive. And how did that work? Did you have one character around which others were spun, or did you kind of were you you know like like creating a, a sort of perfect group of different kinds of personalities you'd like to write about? or did it just sort of you want started off with one and then it got out of hand <laughs> <laughs> that's a very good question i i don't work with an outline so i never know how my books are going to end when i start writing okay but oh wow so you're not one of the whiteboards i'm not although right. i wish i were that seems like an easier way to go about it yeah me. yeah right <laughs> knowing how it would end um yeah, I started with the actor who dies right. on stage in the first chapter. Mm -hmm. And I should mention the book moves back and forth in time for the benefit of between anybody who hasn't read it. when the devastation... Right. It's between disease, the present right. day yeah. and between a moment about 20 years yes. after a flu pandemic. So I began with the actor in the present day and the book kind of spins out from there and follows a number mm -hmm. of people around the actor. A little girl who was mm -hmm. an actress and on stage with him when he died, who then becomes an actor with this traveling symphony. 20 years after a societal collapse. And the symphony, which you alluded to, which is this group of people, you know, in a way it's not dissimilar to the small towns you're writing about. I grew up in a very small place. <laughs> and that phenomenon of everybody knowing everybody else's yes. business, and a fishbowl is a good word for it. And that is a fascinating thing to write about. Yeah. Uh, you know, have these kind of somewhat closed little worlds. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Thank you, ladies. Now, we'll be hearing more from Melanie and Emily shortly, but now it's time to look at debut novelist Nicholas Butler and his shotgun love songs. We recently quizzed him about writing and living in the American Midwest. For me, a novel is about building characters and relationships and a plot that moves forward in a connection with the reader. So. First off, I set off to, to write a series of stories. I never knew that it was going to be a novel. And I wanted the stories to be about rural Wisconsin. But I think it is true that there is a lot of cynicism in, in literature these days. And there's a lot of people that want, there's a lot of writers that want to look smart. And I really don't care what they think about me, whether they think I'm smart or not. I'm interested in creating these characters that are big hearted, kind people. And I think that notions of love and friendship and decent and kindness are intellectually interesting pursuits and ideas and that's what I want to do. I have so many writing heroes. Cormac McCarthy, Annie Proulx, Toni Morrison, Jim Harrison, Tom Goyen, Rick Bass, James Galvin, James Allen McPherson, Marilyn Robinson, I mean, it goes on and on. Steinbeck, Hemingway. The Midwest plays a huge role in my writing. I think mostly it's, I'm very proud of it. It's where I'm from, it's what I know. And I never really thought about writing about anything else. Where I write has mostly been dictated by the fact that I have two small kids. Only recently have I been able to move to this sort of shed that we have on our property, which has like my lawn tractor in it. But it's got a big door and I can open the door and then the sunlight and fresh air comes in and I can smoke cigars in there and not be offensive to anyone else and drink beer. And I find that to be a really creative, good space to be. When I'm not writing, I mean, I love to read, you know? Uh, that's what got me into writing in the, in the first place was that I, I'm a reader. I just finished The Dinner by Herman Koch and that was a good, that was a, not my normal kind of thing to read, but it was expertly written, great plot, uh, interesting the way he sort of structured things and so I recommend that book. My wife and I live in a beautiful area of rural Wisconsin and I have a fantastic back porch that overlooks this valley and some hills beyond and we live beside a buffalo farm so I can see the buffalo come down this hill. So lately I've just been taking beers and going out onto the back porch and looking at the stars and listening to the coyotes at night and just being quiet, you know, like when the kids go to bed, having a moment of quiet is pretty, pretty special. Well, I'm not at all jealous of that writing environment. I'm absolutely fine with it. Uh, which brings us to the kind of confessions and overshare section of the show, because I'm always super curious about people's writing 
uh, sort of regimes and universes. So, Emily, mm -hmm. we've established that you don't have your beautiful wall covered in post-its or a whiteboard with right, cloth no on it. No but do you, no, 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 no buffalo, no whiteboard, no post-its. But do you have a routine? Do you have a regime? You like, I have to get up and get my 500 words done by before I'm allowed coffee, or do you just wait for the muse to strike? Um, I feel if I waited for the muse, I would never write another book. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> no, my program these days, I still have a day job, which I've been holding on to because oh, okay. it has fantastic health insurance, which yeah, right. obviously in the United States is somewhat of a factor. It's 17 hours a week in a cancer research lab. I'm an administrative oh, assistant. Goodness. And the hours are very flexible. So my general routine is to write in the morning for a few hours and then go into work in the afternoons. Yes. Which, you know, is going from work to work um, or sometimes I do it in reverse I'll go to work in the morning come home and then write and then the weekends are intense uh -huh. all right for eight hours okay. straight yeah oh yeah. my god but that's so sad. that must be great so you can have this kind of creative part of the right. day and then right. sort of leave that bit of your brain to rest while you're doing something extremely it's extremely different kind of yeah, yeah. absolutely using a different skill set entirely right and it does force you out into the world and yes you have to speak to exactly, humans exactly exactly you have to interact right right and to speak to different kinds of people is a nice yeah. thing my colleagues are wonderful and they're brilliant and they're involved in science and it's interesting ah, now you're doing the sort of opposite thing of having to kind of immerse yourself in a world that is absolutely not where you're you're in you're in you're in north london is mm -hmm. it and and you're having to pretend you're slightly further north than that like <laughs> up up there in the arctic how on earth do you do that every day do you have like intense air con in a room do you have posters all over the walls what what how do you kind of keep that sense of place real I, i'm tempted to say i just stick my head in the freezer and yeah. <laughs> put the laptop in the freezer um I, actually i do have a series of props i bought one in oh um, yes show and this tell is, this is yeah this is my show it's and beautiful. tell uh, this is a really beautiful inuit carving from soapstone which is the the sort of soft rock that's all over the arctic and this particular one is a shaman and mm -hmm. he's he's half goose you can see the goose wing there in the little web feet so he's my he's my kind of magic talisman can you hold I can, up for the camera I so can, that I can, can rub him and he mine. he'll <laughs> yeah he will tell me where I need to go um, but really it's a place that um, you never forget I mean it lives in my imagination okay. and all I have to do is close my eyes and stick my head in the freezer and <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm there. Um, it's not a place that you ever forget. I even dream sometimes that I'm actually in the Arctic and I wake up and I'm in Hackney. Yeah. <laughs> like, Ooh, what seized you, hasn't it? <laughs> yeah, and Emily, you, you're 20 years in the future, mm -hmm. terrible, terrifying flu has ravaged the world world can look however you want it to because you invented right, it exactly so was there kind of a set of rules when you were coming up with this world was it did, did the story start with the people or was it kind of well, what would this world be like did you one day see a particularly disheveled looking building or <laughs> right. yes. how did you kind of create the pillars of your future universe i suppose the starting point would have been the characters and then, yeah you know we all, i think we all sort of carry an image of what a post-apocalyptic world might look mm. like we've all seen the films of 28 days later uh we've read some books we've yeah. seen and i read books. a lot of that kind of stuff when i was at school uh, kind of 80s sort of terrifying novels which you, right. you read when you're slightly over imaginative exactly. when you're at that sort of febrile point of reading and right just right Right. Yeah, so I had a vague image in my head, and then I did do some research into what life might look like without electricity. Because, of course, oh, you can right. make it out. You can make it up, rather, but you want to go for some degree of plausibility. Yeah. And there are all these details I hadn't known, which, you know, for example, automobile gas goes stale after two or three years. And I would have absolutely messed that up and had Oh, uh, yeah. A car I, I would going have had people stop hours. Piling right. it. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. So things like that, um, which I picked up by going to survivalist forums on the internet. Which oh, is, they must be fun. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> exactly as creepy as it sounds. Uh, tremendously unsettling places, but useful for doing research. Yeah. And, and what did you do? Did you just kind of casually scroll down, exactly. keeping yourself quiet? Or yeah. did you waltz in, like, hi, guys, I, I did what not are your tips? Waltz in. <laughs> It seemed best to keep quiet. Yeah. Right. They're heavily armed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Loads of tin cans exactly. everywhere full of food. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, wow. Because the, the beginning of the novel is especially vivid where, where we get one of the characters being told, look, this flu is happening. Right. You need to take it seriously. And it's right. we're told.
told very clearly that this is his most rational friend ringing the yes, character. Absolutely. So he goes to the supermarket, and it's it's quite brilliant because he sort of just gets kind of overwhelmed. Like I don't know what to do. I've never been at the end of the world before. Right, but he's seen disaster movies as we all have. So yes, he knows to stock up on water and canned goods. And yes, I would yeah. be absolutely in a in a disaster, or indeed in the furthest reaches of the Arctic, uh -huh. dependent on on the culture that right. I'd absorbed in in sort of the last twenty years to tell me how to cope. Right, so exactly. Mm -hmm. It was it was great. And Thank you. Do, do, how did you kind of look at sort of food and drink type things? Did you then once you'd been on this original journalistic trip, then kind of go and live there for a bit. No, oh, I need a sneaky six month just to see how you know day to day yeah, life is. None of this press trip malarkey. field research. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I did. I did. Ret I have returned a few times and and live with Inuit people. Um, and I have uh, a lot of people talk about the food in the Edie Kuklutuk series because you know there's blood soup, there's seal heads, there's yeah. quite a lot of walrus whiskers going down. None of the canned malarkey. Um, and uh, I, li I like to say I've I've tried it all, so you, the reader, don't have to. Um, <laughs> and have you? Yeah, I, pretty you just, much. Yeah, oh, I would have just I, taken a suitcase yeah. of Kendall mint cake. It's, and well, <laughs> for the best. it's a funny thing. It's um, when you're up there, your body changes because you need three times the calories just to stay alive. To stay warm. So you think the first couple of days you think, ooh, whale fat, no thanks. And <gasps> by uh, three weeks in, uh, uh, whale fat is like, give me whale I fat. Really I feel must like whale fat. <laughs> yeah. So oh um, I think you, you know, you just have to adapt to. Uh, the, you have to take your cue from from the people living up there. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a reason people always grab water, <laughs> probably because they need it. Likewise, whale fat. I suppose you have yeah. to kind of trust the tried and tested roots. Thank you, ladies. Now then, Station Eleven starts with the death of a Hollywood actor, and there is further showbiz mayhem of a very different kind in Taking Hollywood, a new thriller that's a collaboration between the novelist Shari Lowe and Hollywood insider Ross King. We caught up with the two of them and some of their showbiz friends at the book's recent UK launch. Well, we're here at the wonderful Mandarin Oriental for the launch of our first ever novel. First ever collaboration. Well, it's about your 560th novel, isn't it? I think it's number 14 or 15. She's very old. I'm really old. and uh, But this is the first one we've worked on together. I asked uh, Shari where the race tickets are, and she said three quarters of the way through, and it's a scene in New York. So I should be like a teenage boy. Well, maybe there's a book in all of us, uh, but certainly you have to have lived a life, and Ross has lived a life, there's no doubt about that. And if he hasn't got stories to tell, nobody has. People who have seen it tell me it's quite raunchy, so I'm worried that I'm not going to be able to talk to Ross on TV anymore without blushing. Ross, you know, he's a dear friend, he's a, he's a staple on Hollywood's red carpets, you know, he's everywhere. Oh, and he's actually a friend, he's a very nice guy. I don't know if anyone will recognize me in the book because anything I ever did at Ross's house was clean. The carpets are filthy. So if there's someone bent down with a J cloth doing the skirting boards, that's me. Nobody knows Hollywood like he does. A, a blend of dark, gritty crime uh, set in Scotland and dysfunction and Hollywood fame and the downsides of Hollywood. And then we take you to Hollywood, bring you all the bright lights, all the glitz, all the glamour, all the secrets. We pull back the curtain and it's very raunchy. Very raunchy. I've lived in Los Angeles now for 14 years and the idea between myself and Shari was that we would draw upon our own experiences because it's two places that we both love, which is Glasgow and Los Angeles. And of course, with my time in LA, I could pull upon so many experiences that I've personally had. We've been friends forever, for um, for over 20 years, and we talked about it before, and then he called me up at the beginning of last year and said, why have we never written a novel? I said, 
let's do it now. So Taking Hollywood was born. We would um, write chunks of it, send it across the Atlantic. The other person would add bits, take away bits, tweak bits, send it back across the Atlantic. And we did that pretty much in 10,000 word chunks the whole way along the novel. And then we had a hilarious weekend in New York where Ross was in New York, I was in Glasgow, and we spent a whole weekend on FaceTime just rewriting the whole book. I think the strangest habit I have when writing, and this is thanks completely to Shari, is that I can actually just act out a scene. I can really act out the whole scene for it as she's watching in FaceTime. And she's busy tapping away, as I say, and then he walks in, then he turns over here, then he says that, and then they do this. And that even involved the sex scene. So that was very interesting FaceTime that uh, no one really? ever wants to see. There certainly will be more. There Sherry certainly King. will more. Ross thinks it's a trilogy. I think it's a five book series. Good so girl. we'll probably <laughs> negotiate somewhere in the middle there. The great part is that we're taking Hollywood ends. The next book, which at the moment is possibly Breaking Hollywood, Breaking Hollywood, starts. So you finish one book, you can go straight into the next book. It starts on the exact same day as the book one finishes. finishes. And everything is resolved in book one. So it's not one of those cliffhangers. Yeah. <laughs> now, will you indulge me with a couple more questions? I'd like to know what each of you are working on now, and I think it's probably not going to be a collaboration. I, although I'd like to see a collaboration between the two of you. Right, on FaceTime over a weekend. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Emily, what, what's next for you? Are you still living in a Station Eleven world, or are you, are you halfway through something else? I am. I'm still living in a Station Eleven world. I've started dreaming of hotel corridors. I'm three <laughs> weeks into a six-week tour. But next, sometime over the winter, I'm going to get back into writing my next novel. I'm only about 30 pages in, so okay. I honestly have no idea what it is or how it ends. But I'm looking forward to so finding out. So it's just sort of starting to form in your mind rather than you're doing the right. work of writing right. up a plot you've already sorted out. Exactly, uh, yeah. I have a sort of half-baked scene that might or might not turn into something. Yeah, so it might right. become crucial and everyone's talking yeah, about exactly. it in a couple of years' yeah. time or you might bin it by Thursday. Or not, right. Or, yeah. I see. Yeah. Melanie, what about you? Are you straight on to more Edie or...? Uh, actually, no. Uh, Edie is going to return. Uh, she's coming back with a bang. She's... But oh, ooh, um, ooh. in the meantime, I've been working on a standalone, which is quite different, um, a psychological thriller, kind of literary psychological thriller. Um, uh, the protagonist is a neuroscientist oh, wow, uh, set in it? during the London riots. Oh, oh goodness. So yeah, that's sort of similar to kind of Station Eleven in that kind of mass panic vibe. There. Well, I live in Hackney, which is where they started. Oh, wow, so, so it was very <laughs> kind of... Yeah. You, we, you were there, you kind of really experienced... I, yeah, I, I, I smelt it. <laughs> and I, I'm not sure that there have been any novels yet that have dealt with the, the No, riots. well, that's, you... that's what I thought, and I'm, I'm very interested in the way that uh, the, the London riots came at the end of a period where there were a lot of teen on there was a lot of teen on teen violence mm. and people were getting very scared of their own teenagers or that's mm -hmm. how it seemed so um, it's got a lot to do uh, with um, how we view uh, our children when our children yes. begin to break away from us. Yeah, yeah. And have you, both of you been, re do you do a lot of reading around your subject before you start? Have you been researching stuff? Or? Yeah, I'm actually working with a, a neuroscientist who uh, is, um, works out of the Maudsley and mm -hmm. the Institute of Psychiatry down in South London. So um, when, I, when I confuse my dopamines from my L-dopa yes, yeah. and my serotonin, she, she, can, she can say, yeah, I, she can wrap my knuckles. And Emily, are you working through 600 dystopian novels to perfect <laughs> the genre? Or you, do, no. do you just go freestyle and read kind of... I go freestyle. I have no plans for Station 12. You know, perhaps yeah. someday I'll yeah. follow one of those characters further. But I think I'd like my next book to be something completely different different. Oh, fantastic. How exciting. Thank you. Um, but I'm afraid that's all we've got time for for this one. I'd just like to thank my guests today, MJ McGrath and Emily St. John Mandel, for coming along and chatting to me and indulging me in the studio. Thank you. We'll be back next month, though, when the sofa will once again be bristling with the very best writers. If you want to get in touch with the programme in the future, you can contact us on Twitter with any book-related questions. And if you want to find out about any of the books that Pan Macmillan publish, you can go to their website, which is www.panmacmillan.com. And if you want to re-watch any part of the show, an on-demand version will be available shortly. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And thank you for watching, and goodbye!